Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Hello and welcome everyone. Um, I hope everyone is doing well on this Masters Friday. My name is Kim Din, and I'm the Vice President of the MIT Alumni Golfers Association. We're happy to bring this conversation with Tom Doak uh, to everybody who is listening and joining in. Um, just a bit, a bit before we get started, um, the MIT Alumni Golfers Association is a newly formed group um, and our mission is pretty straightforward. Connect golfers in our community, both on the course and through events like today. So if you're currently not part of the group, you can find a link to join in the chat and I highly encourage everyone to sign up. And so with that, I'd like to introduce you to my fellow moderator, Jeff Phillips and Tom Doak. Jeff Phillips is a current board member of the MIT Alumni Golfers Association and is also a Golf Digest panelist. Um, while at MIT, he co-founded the MIT Sloan Golf Club. And Tom Doak is a world famous golf architect uh, with multiple courses ranked in the top 100 according to Golf Magazine. And a couple of courses include Pacific Dunes in Oregon and Valley Neal in Colorado. Uh, more recently, Tom was responsible for renovating Memorial Park in Houston, which hosted the Houston Open last week. Uh, personally, I've had the opportunity to play Tumble Creek at Sancadia and this past summer, The Loop. Uh, both great experiences and uh, did not play as well as I would have liked. Uh, Tom spent three years working for Pete Dye uh, and designed his first course when he was 26. Uh, prior to that, Tom started his college career at MIT before transferring to Cornell, where he studied landscape architecture and also spent time in the UK, uh, including caddying at St. Andrews and playing and studying golf courses extensively there. Uh, Jeff will be interviewing Tom for approximately 30 minutes, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience, which you can submit with the Q&A feature. Uh, so with that, we'll turn it over to Jeff and Tom. Thanks so much, Kim. And thanks again, Tom. Really appreciate your taking the time and uh, sharing your insights with uh, this MIT group and a uh, broader audience, too. I see the number of people uh, are uh, joining are, are pretty high. So. I know, as Kim was saying, um, she's played some of your courses, I've played some of your courses, and a lot of people on this call have had just an awesome time playing Tom Doak courses. But there's so many people who haven't had that opportunity. Mm -hmm. So how do you describe your architectural style to someone who's never been to one of your courses? Um, I didn't start using the chart. So a, a writer for Golf Digest, Ron Witten, who I've known for years, started using the term minimalist to describe what we do. The idea that you're, you know, if you've got a good piece of land to work with, which I've gotten a reputation for being the good guy to call for that kind of project, you know, you shouldn't really, you should be able to figure out how to lay out a golf course that doesn't, you don't have to move much dirt to make it work. Um, you know, you, you're going to have to shape the greens because greens are so fast now. If there's very much slope in them at all, it's, it's hard to keep a ball on them. You know, you're going to have to build flat tees. You're going to have to build some bunkers. But ideally, you're not having to move too much dirt around in the fairways at all, because those are big areas. And that's where that's where the cost adds up. And, you know, that's certainly the way all of the older golf courses in the United States were built, everything before, say, the 1930s. Um, and, you know, when I started getting into the business in the 1980s, it was just the opposite of that. Everybody just, you know, like dug ponds and used all that dirt to create dunes and mounds in between the holes and say it looked Scottish. And I, you know, I've been fortunate to spend a year in Scotland on a scholarship from Cornell right after I graduated. And what people in America were selling as Scottish was way, way, way different than what golf in Scotland was all about. So, you know, I started you know, I'd already started thinking about why can't we build courses that are more like the old courses that I really like. And then that year in Scotland just absolutely convinced me there's no reason to be moving dirt around. You know, you can take even the wildest looking landscape and turn it into a golf course. Yeah. Well, uh, one of the courses you uh, recently completed was Memorial Park in Houston, which Kim mentioned, and taking redesigned that municipal um, course into your first uh, PGA Tour stop. Were you happy with how it played last week? Yeah, I mean, that's really my, I've done a course in Scotland that's hosted the Scottish Open on the European Tour a couple of times, but, but this was really the first time I've done a course for the PGA Tour and 
because of the weird schedule changes this year because of COVID. Um, originally, the dates for the tournament were this week. And then when everything started changing around, the Masters really wanted this week. <laughs> and the Houston guys were like, we'll do that. But one of our conditions is we have to go the week before because we think, we'll, you know, we'll get a much better field that way. You know, there's some of the players want to take the week off before a major championship, but, but a good, at least half of them want to be going into the tournament with a little momentum and, you know, feel like they're playing well in competition. So so they had a great field for the tournament this year for, you know, for kind of an off season, late season event. I mean, normally they don't get fields like that. And this year they had half the top 10 players and, and just a bunch of great guys and, and, a, and a bunch of guys playing really well. And it was, we talked a little before the, the, the conference started. I mean, when I'm, when I'm done building a golf course, when, when you're building it the whole time you're building it, the one thing you can't do is play test it at all you know, cause it's all dirt. So you don't get to see how the ball reacts when it lands. And if it lands on that little roll off on the side of the green, how far is it going to get away? You know, you can visualize that because you've done it a lot, but it's still different than actually seeing it in play and seeing whether it works the way you meant it to. And, you know, unfortunately, unless you're a really, really good golfer, it's still hard when you go back to get a sense of that sometimes because you don't see that you don't see the shot that you're worried about. You know, mm -hmm. you can play up five times with a bunch of different guys and nobody hits that shot. But when you've got all of the best players in the world playing your golf course, they land the ball right where they want to a lot of the time. So you get to see really quick, okay, does this work the way I think it's going to? And I was super pleased with how it went down there. I mean, you know, one of the problems for designing golf courses now is everybody now hits it so long that that we all think, well, it's, you know, it's impossible to challenge these guys unless the golf course is just a million miles long. And, uh, and what I found this week was that now that, you know, that public golf course actually you know, building greens that had some slope in them and they're not really fast from week to week when it's just being played by a bunch of muni golfers. And they take the, they take the green speeds, they start about a month before the tournament and start ratcheting the green speeds up to tour speed. That makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that really made a big difference was the rough was just perfect playability for there where, you know, it wasn't super deep where you had to hack the ball out at, at all, but but it was, you know, it was almost impossible to hit the ball cleanly. So you, you know, it took a lot of spin off the ball. So if you're in the fairway, you could hit a shot or they could hit a shot. I can't, but they could hit a shot and have it, you know, land and basically stop on a dime. They weren't spinning the ball back too much. I don't think there's enough like roots in the grass yet because the new greens are only a year old, but, but it would just hit and stop. But out of the rough, it would hit and release 30 or 40 feet. And a lot of those greens, if you did that, it, it was off the side of the green and down the hill away from it and leaving really different, difficult recovery shots. So, so to hear a bunch of really great 25 year old players who, you know, who we all think can't be beat say, yeah, when I get, when I would walk up to the ball and it was in the rough instead of the fairway, I was just, I totally had to change my thought and not think about hitting it close to the hole anymore. And just think about playing defensively and trying to make sure I could make par. And that was a really nice thing to hear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's great. I mean, it, it was really fun to watch on TV too and in creating challenge, not through distance, but through um, just around the greens. It, uh, it's something you don't see week in, week out of the PJ tour. No, it, you know, it's kind of trickery. I mean, you know, I said to the client in the beginning, and I should mention the client was, so the client was not the city. Um, the city owns the golf course, but uh, the client is Jim Crane who owns the Houston Astros and owns a huge logistics business. And, and you know, Shell had dropped their sponsorship of the Houston Open because they were laying people off and they couldn't do the PR of being laying people off on one hand and paying $6 million a year to host the pro golf event on the other. And 
they were the city was going to lose the golf event entirely. And Mr. Crane stepped in and said, you know, yeah, I don't want the total sponsorship of it because I don't really sell to people. You know, I don't, I don't need that much advertising. But there's plenty of companies in Houston that want this tournament to stay here and they'll all chip in for that, for the sponsorship money. You know, we'll have plenty of money for that. I'm not worried about that. Um, but the other thing was they were playing it on a course up in the suburbs and then, you know, just they didn't have big crowds for the event. And, you know, these guys all wanted to move it back downtown. So they said, separately, we're going to raise a bunch of money to redo the golf course downtown so that the tournament can be down here. So we can, you know, so we can all do corporate hospitality close to our offices and have a lot of people come out. And of course, this year, you know, a lot of people was 2000 or 2500 people a day which was, you know, it was the first tour event that it even allowed that because mm -hmm. Texas is a little more lax on those rules. Uh, but next year, it's going to, I think it's going to be a really big deal. I think there'll be tons of people there because mm -hmm. that golf course, they do 60,000 rounds a year of public play. Um, there, and I guarantee you, every one of those guys wants to see how the best players in the world play the same golf course. That's a really cool feature. You know, there's not that many tour events where you get that. You know, one of the reasons Pebble Beach is so popular is because you could play where the pros play. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a really great thing for Houston. But the golf world is now obviously focused on Augusta. What's your favorite hole at Augusta National? Favorite? Um, I'd say either 13 or 14. I mean, 13 is a famous hole. Everybody knows yeah. about that. You know, it's that's the most beautiful part of that property down, down in the bottom along the Creek with all the, you know, with just a million azaleas that are not in bloom this week, <laughs> lying in the left side of the fairway on the other side of the Creek from the golf hole. Um, you know, it was, in a, it was a civil war nursery. So there's, there's just a million flowering plants that are a hundred years old out there. Um, yeah. You know, not like you'd see anywhere else. And then 14, because it's, you know, it's, it's a hole on pretty plain topography, but it's just totally made by a great, really severe green like you would never see anywhere else. And, you know, and that really dictates play. You know, the guys want to be on a certain side of the fairway to attack certain hole locations without the, without the shot getting away from them. And, you know, it's hard to watch, you know, Augusta is so much hillier than you can tell on TV. You know, you think you can see slope, but, you know, when you're there for the first time, you're like, well, this is probably three times as hilly as I visualized from watching TV all these years. And so the greens, even though they look kind of flat, you know, once you've been there once or twice, you, you can watch on TV and see a guy hit it 20 feet above the hole and go, he has no chance from there. You know, he's just, he's just praying he can make par from there in two putts. Uh, so it's much more fun to watch on TV if you're, you know, if you're familiar enough with the golf course to, to know how severe some of those shots are. If you can make a change to one hole at Augusta, what would you change? Ooh, you know, I, I usually avoid that question because Augusta is such a, you know, I wouldn't say it's sacred ground. It's been changed a lot over the years. And if anything, you know, I'd be looking for what could I change back to the way it used mm. to be. And, and probably the most prominent thing is Mackenzie built several courses late in his career with a one green that was kind of like a boomerang shaped green. And originally that was the, what's now the ninth green at Augusta. It was going to be the 18th green when he designed the golf course and they reversed the nines right away. But that ninth green now, you know, it's, it sits right at the top of like a 30 foot slope. So if you're, if you're short with the approach at all, it just comes way back down the hill. It's scary as heck. Um, and then they, you know, they changed the green and they shrunk it. So it's, you know, it's not a very big target at all. You know, you have to get past the, you have to get past the front and then there's not much space there and you've got to, or you've got a really scary putt back toward that slope that you could putt off the green and down the hill too. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that that old group, that old original green wouldn't have been as hard for the players now, but it would have been way more fun for the members than trying to play the hole that they've got now. 
Hmm. Is it boomerang? Was it boomerang green like a crystal downs? Kind of. Yeah. I mean, I can't, you know, I don't, I don't have a model of exactly whether the slopes were the same as or not. I mean, the, the one at Crystal Downs kind of sits in a punch bowl, so you can't, you couldn't put it off the green. I'm sure it wasn't that exactly like that sitting way up on the top of that hill like that, but it did, you know, basically where the back left green side bunker is now, the green wrapped around the front left bunker and back into that space. Yeah. It was only there for maybe five or 10 years before they changed it. That'd be cool. Well, your Doak scale is well known for appraising courses. When you step onto a course for the first time, how do you approach assessing the course or evaluating good holes from mediocre holes? Well, to me, the most, you know, the highest praise I can have for a golf course that I haven't seen is that it's got something a little different than I've seen everywhere else. You know, that's, that's worth a lot because, you know, really that, the whole confidential guide series is about, do you want to spend your money to travel to see this golf course? You know, it's not, it's not so much, you know, you could look at being a movie critic in two ways, you know, are, are you, are you like getting into the details of how it was made and how it could be better? Or are you really just trying to tell the audience, do they want to go see this movie or not? And you know, with the golf courses, I'm, I might get into the details a little bit, but at the end of the day, it's about, do you want to travel to see this? Is it worth the time? Is it worth the money? Um, so, so something that's a little different from anywhere else, that's a huge yes. That's, that's worth a lot of points. Um, you know, beyond that, at some point, you just start thinking about, well, what does this remind me of? And, you know, what does it, what would I compare it to either, you know, the courses that are in that same region, if you're going to Scotland, is it, you know, is it better than that? You know, is it better than Kilspindy? Is it, is it as good as Dornick? That, you know, the, the Doak scale was really only meant, you know, it's, I always say it's a logarithmic scale because the difference between a five and a seven is a lot. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, it, it's just a simple thing. And, and honestly, my, my wife says, and she would, we weren't married when I wrote the book originally, but she says, boy, it would be a really good book without the numbers in it. <laughs> and that's true. You know, you know, just the, I, to me, the, the little like one paragraph description of what the, you know, why this, why is this a cool place or not? That's the most important thing. But the reason I started doing the numbers was that I wanted to be able, for example, for Augusta, I wanted to be able to write about the things that I didn't love about it that, you know, something different than what everybody else says every day, and then still put a number at the end of nine to say, I still think this is one of the best courses in the world. Don't get me wrong, just because I had two paragraphs about how the 18th hole is way more uphill and not really that great a hole, except it's famous because they play tournaments on it every year and something big happens there all the time. Yeah. Well, you've restored numerous courses from lots of Golden Age architects, uh, think about McKenzie or Tellinghast or Rayner and, and C.B. McDonald. Is there one you identify with more closely than others or you find easier to work on? Uh, certainly the, the early stages of my career, I idolized Alistair McKenzie and you know, I wanted to see as many courses of his as possible. I, I co-wrote a biography of him at one point. Um, and I, you know, that's, that's what got me to Australia for the first time and New Zealand. And, you know, I'd seen most of what he'd done in the UK and the US, but Mackenzie was one of the first worldwide golf course architects in the, in the mid twenties, he got divorced and just, you know, basically took off for America where, you know, where golf course architecture was really booming. And he had, you know, he had met two or three, he met Robert Hunter, the, a golf writer who was starting work in California at that time. He'd met Perry Maxwell. Both of them had come to the UK to see the golf courses there and just happened to meet McKenzie. So McKenzie came to America armed with, you know, not just contacts, but some guys who could help him, you know, get work and build golf, build the golf courses if he came and got involved. So he very quickly got very busy here. And then um, he, was asked to consult at Royal Melbourne in Australia uh, 
part of, through a connection with the RNA. And his suggestion to Royal Melbourne was, you know, they were going to pay him a thousand pounds to consult, to come all the way to Australia from, from, <laughs> from the UK to, to relay out their golf course. And, and he said, well, okay, why don't we, why don't you try to arrange other consulting work for me while I'm there and we'll split the money. So Royal Melbourne actually made money on having Alistair McKenzie in Australia. <laughs> and McKenzie, instead of just consulting on the one or two golf courses, cons consulted on like 17 of them in the space of six weeks, which means he wasn't in any of them for very long. And he had to have somebody else stay behind and be the one who implemented those things because he never went back. That was his one and only trip to Australia was six weeks in 1926. And, you know, some of the courses like Royal Melbourne, it actually took them a few years before they built everything that he had suggested. Um, so he never saw him, even when he wrote his book toward the end of his career. Um, you know, he left out some of his now most famous golf courses because he didn't really have any personal experience with them after, after he was there to lay them out. And so when you approach restoring McKenzie design, I guess, how do you think about that differently than Tellingcast or, or someone else? Is it, I guess, do you, how do you get in their minds? Uh, to be honest, I don't try to get in their minds that much. I think, I think that's a, you know, I think when other architects do that, that's that's their sales pitch for getting the job. I'm an expert in McKenzie or I'm an expert in telling half. You know, I take the view that I personally, when I'm building a new course, I'm not trying to do the same thing everywhere. I'm trying to do something different than the other courses I've done. And I've got to believe that McKenzie and Donald Ross and Perry Maxwell and those guys were no different as far as that goes. So the most important thing is to, you know, look at what they actually built. You know, look at all the old, you know, find all the old aerial photos that you can find. Find whatever member took a home movie of the golf course. Anything that goes, that goes back to what was actually on the ground when they started uh, is really important. And kind of trumps, you know, even McKenzie in his, in his, he wrote two books. And in his later book, you know, his, his first book had these 13 principles for ideal design that people, that's been quoted everywhere for as long as I've been interested in golf course architecture. But then his second book, which was a manuscript that he couldn't, he didn't manage to sell to a publisher during the depression and just sat in a family member's trunk for like 50 years <laughs> until they dug it out and said, wow, maybe somebody wanna publish this now. <laughs> uh, you know, in that he said, you know, he, he wrote about some of these, some of his 13 original points and said, I wish I hadn't said it that way. I mean, people, people just, you know, he's, one of the things was you should have, if, if possible, you should have two loops of nine holes for the 18 hole design. And in his later book, he's like, you know, that just, there's a lot of times that doesn't work out. Cypress point, that wasn't going to work out. You know, I didn't, you know, you're not going to reject doing the golf course because you can't make it into two loops of nine. You're just going to figure out the best thing you can. Uh, but he said, you know, so those are the kind of things you stereotype what an architect does or doesn't do. Like, oh, Donald Ross built, always built greens up now. Or, oh, he, he never put bunkers behind greens. No, not true. You just have to go look at what he actually did instead of what he said in general terms. Yeah. And also it seems like you're getting on just the evolution of the architect that with different courses and as they mature, they try different things. And Sure. Sure. Everybody is good at what they do is going to keep learning and keep changing their ideas a little bit over time. You know, you, you have a general philosophy that probably doesn't change too much or evolves much more slowly, but, but the, you know, it's all in the details and the details are, you know, inspiration comes from anywhere and it comes from other people working on the job, you know, might get you to do something you wouldn't have done somewhere else. Yeah. As, as you look ahead to the rest of your career, what are your goals? What do you hope to achieve? You know, I really, there was a period there about, you know, 
six or eight years ago that I was kind of struggling to come up with. I, I needed new goals. You know, I mean, honestly, at the beginning of my career, and it was realistic, I thought I'd be very lucky if I, you know, if I ever got to build 10 or 20 golf courses on my own and, and get one rated in the top 100. And then, and then I, you know, I had a chance on the most beautiful piece of land I'd ever seen on the Oregon coast to do a really special golf course. And everything went right for two years in, in planning and building it. And, you know, it, it's ranked very high in the best golf courses in the world. And all of a sudden, like a door opened and there were a lot more projects like that in the office. So, so between like 2000, 2008, it was like every time somebody called me, it was about a beautiful piece of land somewhere. And I was like, well, I know this can't go on forever. And, you know, the, the, the crash in 2008 really cut off. You know, since then, I mean, we've gone from building 300 golf courses a year in America to building like five or 10. And I'm just extremely lucky that I'm one of the guys who gets to build one of the five or 10, you know, because most everybody else is just struggling to do enough consulting work to stay in the business. Um, and, you know, and even me, I, I mean, you know, 12 years since then, I've, I think we've only built like six or seven new courses in the U S but also another four or five overseas and a lot of consulting work. So we've stayed pretty busy. Um, and, and all of a sudden now it seems like, you know, the pandemic's obviously going to change the world and may change some of my clients ideas about whether their project is viable because a lot of my stuff has been, uh, tourism related. Let's build a golf course, you know, let's build a golf course that will make more people come here. And it's hard to tell, you know, until there's a real vaccine and everybody feels safe flying again, that business model is a little iffy compared to what it was. Um, yeah. You know, places like Memorial Park or, or resorts that are like Sand Valley, where we're going to do a course in Wisconsin, you know, same developer as Band and Dunes, but but instead of relying on nearly everybody to get on a plane, that's driving distance from Chicago and Milwaukee and Minneapolis. And that's just, you know, that's boomed like crazy this year. You know, yeah. people are happy to go get in a car and go someplace a couple hours away and be outside for a couple of days playing golf. So, uh, so, you know, the market is all mixed up right now, but I'm lucky enough. I think I'll keep kind of busy and we've got, half a dozen new projects lined up to do that I think two or three of them will start next spring for sure. And the other one's hopefully pretty close behind that. That's great. Uh, yeah, you're definitely in, in demand. Um, so uh, one more question. Uh, I see there are lots of questions being um, entered into uh, the Q&A box. So uh, okay. please put in those questions and Kim will uh, moderate in a second. Um, but Tom, have you been finding in conversations you have with site owners that they're asking a lot more about distance or Bryson influenced uh, topics than they were a couple years ago? You know, that's been an ongoing topic for 30 or 40 years. I mean, even when I worked for Pete Dye, he had me ghost write things about how sooner or later they're going to have to do something about the equipment to make up for the fact that these guys are stronger and they, you know, they keep they keep pushing the envelope of the, you know, the, there's been a distance requirement on the ball by the USGA for like 50 years now. But, you know, the technology to like optimize for your own game has gotten so much better in just the last five or 10 years. That's some of what Bryson's doing, you know, is partly, you know, changing his body and bulking up and, you know, what he's done, on that level is unprecedented. I, there's not an example of a golfer that's that's changed his body that much specifically to try to get better. Uh, but, you know, part of the only reason it works is because he can also look at all these different shafts and club heads and, you know, I mean, the, the, the equipment that I grew up with, he would break if he was swinging that hard. <laughs> so it's, it's uh, so it's the two together and um, you know, the, the governing bodies for years have kind of, 
have talked about it, but they've also said, well, we made a standard and as long as it keeps to the standard, it won't keep going crazy. And, you know, for years we've kind of thought it's going to take something like this, you know, another like big jump for them to say, okay, you know, we thought it couldn't, that couldn't happen. It could only creep up very slowly. If there's a big jump, I think they're going to do something about it. And honestly, that's a little unfair to Bryson because I mean, he's, he's gained everything he's done legitimately, but, but, but by the same token, if you make golf course, if you make the equipment shorter, being a longer hitter is only going to be that much more valuable. It's because it's at the end of the day, it's only about your ability relative to everybody else's. So being able to hit the ball long, you know, even if they change the golf ball and it only goes 85% as far, you know, the same guys are going to have an advantage. They might even have more advantage because as of now, a, you know, a lot of golf courses, well, I mean, most everybody on the pro tour is so long that being long is not that much of an advantage because everybody is. And you, you know, we don't build golf courses long enough to, to make it long for them. I mean, they'd have to be 500 yards longer than what we're building now. And most, you know, the older courses don't have room for that. And there's only been a very few new courses that tried to do. Yeah. And think about what you did at Memorial Park. That wasn't how you try to create challenge. It was more with the green complexes and that's Yeah, uh, Memorial is actually funny because back in the old days, it was it was like a 7,300 yard course back in the 50s and 60s when that was really hard. You know, it was the flattest golf course that you've ever seen. There wasn't, there wasn't a lot of features on it to make it interesting. It was just long. And so it was challenging and a lot of good, you know, they've always had a lot of good players around that place. And over the years, you know, even though it was long, that that meant less and less until it, you know, it just wasn't anything that would challenge great players anymore by the time we were asked to look at it. Great. Well, I know that there are so many questions that people have for you. So I'll hand it over to Kim and she okay. could uh, feed you some of those questions. Thanks, Tom. Okay. Yep. So I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Feel free to continue to submit questions. We do have a bunch on the line, so I don't think we'll be able to get through all of them. But if you have a favorite question in the chat, go ahead and like that. And then we'll make sure the popular ones get asked. Uh, so to start, um, one of the questions is, how does where does Stonewall rank in all of the courses you've designed? Uh, there's actually two golf courses there. One, one I built really early in my career was the first private club that I built. And it's, it's about 45 minutes west of Philadelphia. And then they bought, they bought some extra land next to it so nobody would develop next to it. And like 10 years later, they were in really good financial position. They were like, why don't we just build another guy? We'd only have to buy another 50 acres to build another 18 holes. Why don't we do that? So, you know, for me, the interesting thing about it was I built two courses 10 years apart. And the second one, the, the first one they had a, they had a very strong feel. They wanted a classic looking old style Philadelphia course with, you know, greens that had a lot of tilt from back to front and or side to side in many cases there. And we did that and it's always been a really tough golf course. And then, you know, for the second course, 10 years later, it's like, okay, what can we do to be different here? And, the, you know, and that was kind of you know, that gave me something to work off of. I really like when instead of just build me a great golf course, we've got some other like specific assignment to do. And in that case, it was, you know, let's make something that really feels kind of different from this, but just as good. And so the second course was more about, you know, the greens have a lot more complexity and variety to them. So that unlike the first course where you, you know, you always want to be, you always want to miss kind of at the front of the green and be below the hole on the, on the newer course below the hole could be a lot of different places around the green, depending on where the, where the hole is and where that part of the green tilts. All right. Thanks for that answer response. Um, well, so many of us are MIT alums. Um, not everybody on this, uh, the, chat is, but related to MIT, did, during your freshman year and the time you spent at MIT, 
Did you get to play any of the great courses in the Boston area? Uh, you know, the only one. Um, so, so I started there in the fall of 78. And, you know, I really had a great, you know, I, I don't know, is it still past fail freshman year? It was when I was there. And so that was, so. that just took the pressure off worrying about grades so much. But, you know, I was a kid who'd always scored really high in math and science stuff. And I, and I really do think that that's related to the career I do now in an odd way. A lot of people think of it as artistic and very freehand. And there is some of that, it's more sculptural, but it's also like understanding how things work in three dimensions and topography and trajectory of golf balls and everything else. So, you know, it's a good combination for me. I use the engineering side of my brain a lot more than people think. It's just a weird way to do it. Uh, so fall of 78, I'm like following the end of the baseball season, which was, that was a great season to live in Boston, unless you're a Red Sox fan. Um, and then, you know, taking all the freshman classes and history of architecture and a few other things. But, you know, by the end of, by the start of the second semester, I found myself like just going back and reading all these golf books. And I thought, you know, I got to, I got to pursue this, you know, and, and golf course architecture was not a visible profession back then. You know, nobody, there was no literature on how to pursue that as a career for good reason. There's not, you know, it's hard, you know, there's not many people that are going to be really successful in this at any given time. So you can't like tell everybody, you know, it's like if you told everybody how to be a great actor, there'd be way too many, but this is a much smaller little niche. And this, you know, every golfer is interested in doing it, but you can't have them all be architects. So, um, so even Cornell that's had a few golf course architects go through, they don't really promote that at all. Cause they would just, if they turned out three students a year, two of them would struggle to find work. Um, but so when I started thinking I'm gonna do this, uh, you know, I wrote to three or four of the clubs around Boston to see if they'd let me come walk the golf course. And the only answer I got back was from the green chairman, who's like the guy who, the member who interacts with the superintendent at the country club at Brookline. And he was like, you're welcome to come out in the spring and play as my guest. So my roommate and I, you know, carried our clubs and took the tee to about a mile from the golf course and then hiked that to get there. And, you know, it was like end of April or the first of May. And it was really kind of a bad day and there weren't hardly any members around. So the guys were like, yeah, just, you can play the championship course. There's nobody out there anyway. <laughs> Cause it's, it's 27 holes and they use a mix for the tournament and you, the members normally wouldn't do that, but they let us do it, which was really fun. And then I learned that day just by accident that the person to write to was not the golf pro or the superintendent who could get in trouble if they let the wrong person out there to look around. But the green chairman was a member. So you're just the your member's guest for the day. And so the next year when I started writing those letters from Cornell, basically everybody said yes. I mean, I had invitations to play Cypress Point, San Francisco Golf Club, and Oakmont, and Marion, and Pine Valley, uh, all just from writing a nice letter. Oh, well, that's fantastic. Very cool story about the country club as well. Um, you made reference to how golf course architecture is kind of a niche area. And yeah. a couple of people I've asked, um, how does someone go about aspiring to be a golf course architect? How do you go about getting into this business, especially if you don't have millions of dollars? Well, it's funny because I get like, even now, I mean, there was a lull, but I must get 15 or 20 letters a year from, from people like the ones I used to write when I was 19 years old. And, you know, and like six or eight of them will be from guys that are 30 or 40 years old and in some other profession and maybe doing well in it. And they just think, you know, they've read that Alistair McKenzie was a doctor for a while and switched and became a golf course architect. So they think they can do it. I'm just like, well, you could, but there's, you know, it's just so competitive now. That, that's the hard part. You know, I, I mean, I have four people on my payroll right now and about 10 others that we've trained over the years who all are 
you know, passionate about it. They've seen a lot. They're really talented. And it's really hard for them to find a chance to break in and get their first job or, or really, you know, sometimes the first job isn't the hardest because you'll, you know, the, the developers of a lot of these things are they're dreamers and they like the story of, you know, hiring a young guy and giving him a chance. So it's really more like the third and fourth golf course when you've done one thing and the, all the people competing with you have done 25. It's just, it's just hard to compete. Um, you know, you don't have experience and you're not a, you're not a cute story anymore. Um, you know, to me, uh, my advice to anybody now is if you think you want to do it, don't change majors, go to school for it right away. You know, find a job, build a golf course for a year somewhere and see how much you like that. Because the odds that you're going to wind up being the guy whose name goes on the golf course, it's really small, you know, but it takes a lot of people to build a really good golf course. I mean, you know, I have like, I'll have like three or four guys that work for me that are part of it and really have input on it and a golf course superintendent, a golf course contractor. And, you know, I mean, any good course, I would say there's like 10 or 12 people that have had some real input into making that a really good golf course. And so those are better odds. And on top of that, you just, you know, you need to understand the, the lifestyle that you're signing up for the, you know, the, the amount of travel and being away from home that it is the uncertainty factor of it all. Like, you know, we sign up a job, but we get, we might get paid 10% of the fee up front. And then we're sitting there waiting until they say, okay, we've got all the permits and we've got all the money and we're ready to go. And that could take years. And sometimes it just doesn't happen at all. So, you know, it's very hard being a small businessman in this particular business. You know, you have like one or two big contracts that make or break your year. And then, you know, trying to do a bunch of little consulting work to just pay the bills and get by. Got it. Uh, very insightful. Um, a little bit related to all of the challenges with course design, there's also a big issue in golf in general is pace of play. And one of the questions is that how and can course design address some of those pace of play issues? Uh, course design addresses it a little bit. I mean, the main thing is, the two main things are like getting the greens and tees close together, you know, from, from one green to the next tee. That's gotten to be more, more of a focus for me as I've worked in the business longer, because I really think the best course is, it's not just that that makes it an easier walk, it's that it makes the whole experience so seamless that you never like get out of the flow of playing golf. You know, if, if, there's, if there's a long enough break that you think about checking your cell phone, the, the routing could have been better or should have been better. Um, and obviously, you know, developers pushed against that for years. They wanted to stretch out the golf course as much as they could to put more housing around it. And that's, that's less of an influence right now. It used to be that 85% of the golf courses built were built with housing developments around them. Now, most of that 85% just went completely away. <laughs> you know, there's, you know, since the recession in 2008, there are not a lot of housing development golf courses being built at all. Uh, and I don't know that that segment will ever really, it won't come back in those numbers ever again. Uh, but, you know, slow play is, you know, I've, I've gotten to hang around a little bit with Brooks Kepka, who was my consultant for the golf course at Memorial Park. And, you know, he's a funny guy. He's, uh, he's seen as outspoken now before he was, before he started winning, everybody just thought he was some dumb jock from Florida and kind of a quiet guy and kept to himself. You know, he, he wouldn't ace his SATs, but he's, he's a really smart golfer, uh, you know, he, and he thinks he, he plays better in major championships because it really matters there thinking your way around the golf course and not missing in the wrong spots. And, and he does that extremely well. And some of the other guys are just, they're not used to doing it. Week in and week out, you don't have to do that so much on tour. And there's only a few guys that focus on the majors the way he does, but he is 
like an outspoken player about slow play being a problem. He just hates it. And, and all the players on the tour will, will tell you off the record that the only way they're ever going to fix that problem is to actually penalize them. You know, it costs shots. If it costs shots, they're going to, they're going to speed up really fast to make sure that they, cause you know, they're all, they're all about wanting to win. You know, they cannot afford to give up any shots for a slow play penalty. The only problem with penalizing them is it's hard to like pinpoint who's the guy who's slowing everything down sometimes because everybody, you know, you're always going to get a couple of shots in a round of golf where you're way out of position and you need to think about it and figure it out a little bit. You know, you just didn't expect to be over here. Um, but there's plenty of guys now, unfortunately, the, the reason to me, the reason it's gotten so much slower is because, there's been so much more attention to the mental side of golf and everybody going through exactly the same pre-shot routine to get themselves in the perfect place mentally. And, you know, so they have this routine that takes 20, 25 seconds before they hit a shot. And then like a butterfly goes past and they have to step back and redo it all again. It's slower than hell when that happens. Um, and they got to do something about it. Cause it's bad for, it's bad for TV. It's bad for people watching on at the tournament, nobody likes. No, I totally agree. I played my share of competitive golf and it trickled those same examples, behaviors you see trickle down and it's frustrating to play for sure. Oh my God. I mean, I used to be a really fast player. I would play the public course that I grew up near in like two and a half hours if there was nobody out there. And the first time I went to try to play a junior tournament, it was seven hours. I almost died out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, time to get off the golf course at you know, hour five. Um, so another question is um, climate change is certainly an issue. And what are some of the implications of climate change on golf course design? Um, and do you think about how irrigation systems and how that is affected by climate change? Uh, you know, I, to me personally, well, I mean, climate change will affect golf in all kinds of weird ways. You know, I'm famous for doing coastal golf courses and some of them may be affected by that at some point. Even some of the really famous old courses in the UK will be, you know, there's places like uh, Brancaster in England or even St. Andrews. St. Andrews is not very far above sea level and it's all you know, they've, it's got a deep drainage system under it now to get the water off it faster, but there's not a lot of room to spare us. If sea levels rise a couple of feet, St. Andrews is not going to drain very well anymore. Um, so, so obviously there's those effects, but to me, the biggest environmental issue for golf the whole time has been water and just, you know, being able to justify using that much water to take care of a golf course. And, you know, up till recently, we've never tried to do anything to recycle water or, you know, so like Memorial Park, the golf course in Houston used to use 60 million gallons a year of city water to irrigate the golf course, even though it rains a lot in Houston. I mean, it's not a droughty place. So a lot of time it's getting the irrigation it needs from the sky, but that was, that was the amount of city water they used. So at the start of the project, they said to us, you know, we'd like you to reduce that as much as you can by trying to recapture a runoff and put it back into the system instead of, it, basically the golf course sits, there's kind of a ravine that works its way up to the edge of the golf course and up into the front nine a little bit. And that drains right into the bayou that runs through downtown Houston and out to the Gulf eventually. You know, so the, you know, when the, when the hurricane happened four or five years ago, and the whole town was flooded, the water was backed up into Memorial Park a ways too. Um, so the trick was, you know, we had to, we were trying to capture the water kind of flowing toward the ravine and out and put it back into the pond, but you've got to build the pond high enough that it doesn't flood as part of the system flooding. So you, get, you, you, you basically catch it down fairly low and pump it back up into the pond. But uh, in the, since they opened the golf course in the last 12 months, they've used no city water. Recapturing, the because it rains enough there that if you just capture it 
you know, there's plenty of supply. Uh, it's amazing how much water they recapture. And that was, you know, the funny thing is, I did that all myself, just kind of seat of the pants engineering, trying to figure out, you know, how, you know, we, we couldn't, we did, we couldn't capture the water on the lower end of the site. It was, that would have been very awkward to pump it back. So we just said, look, we think if we capture this half, basically the back nine, plus there is water flowing into the site from offsite in a couple of places, that that's really going to be plenty for what we need. And it turned out to be. Um, but I was really pleased with that part of it. And that's something that just flies over everybody's head. And I, I do think golf courses have to think a lot more about that. Another one, another project that we did was really interesting about that. Um, I did a project in Bordeaux in France, in Saint Emilion, the great, where all the great wines come from. Um, and there all the, you know, they, they look at a golf course as just agriculture because they don't have any golf courses. <laughs> and and all the rules, of course, are written to protect the wineries and protect the old famous wineries from competition in some way. So one of those rules is you can't sink a well to get water. I don't know if there would be any well water or not, but you're not allowed to use it even if there is. You're only allowed to use what falls on your property naturally. So for, that's why vintages are important to French wine, because when you have a year with not much rain or a year with a lot of rain, that totally changes what you get in the grapes. And, you know, the best of them know how to blend it together differently. And obviously the ones that are sitting on the best soils start with a great advantage. And, and that's what brings it out. Uh, but I was really skeptical at first that, that we could collect enough rainwater to irrigate the golf course for a full year because it's a really dry place in the summer. Uh, and we were fortunate that the golf course just kind of all sat in a bowl. So basically everything that hits the property drains toward the bottom and we put a big pond at the bottom. And, and then, you know, it's actually an advantage for the golf course superintendent to not have an unlimited supply of water because when people start saying, eh, it's starting to look a little brown, you should irrigate. He can look them right in the eye and say, if I do that, we might be totally out of water next month. You know, and it just, cause the, the, you know, that's the other thing is the grass doesn't need to be watered nearly as much as most people do it. You know, superintendents do that because their job's on the line. The members want it to look green. It's, it's an easy, you know, it's an easy fix. Nobody, nobody ever got fired for their golf course looking too green, but that attitude's got to change some point here pretty soon if there's still going to be a lot of golf courses because there's going to be a lot of places in the world they will say you can't have that much water there's no way we can let you have that much water anyway um, makes for a different playing experience too and i have always wanted to see courses a little drier it's also a little bit more fun more yeah for you know that's that's the way the game started with no irrigation at all and when those links courses get dry it's like you know plan on the tile floor almost the ball bounces and gets away from you a lot yeah for sure um okay so i think we are running close to two so we only have for a couple more questions okay. um so here's one that's been on the docket uh can you talk about your lido project in wisconsin and then how much of your own creativity and ingenuity will we see and how much of it will be pure engineering versus trying to recreate um the this project as closely as possible. So, so for like 30 years that I've been in the business that people have talked about this old golf course that was on Long Island. It was on the barrier strip. It was like a few miles east of Coney Island on that barrier strip between the Atlantic and the intercoastal waterway. And it was one of the great golf courses in America in the 1920s. They, they, they dredged and filled the whole thing to build it. It was just a flat swampy piece of land to start with. And, you know, it was considered one of the best golf courses in America and it went bust in the depression. And eventually they sold it to the town to build a school and some housing. And they built a public course down the road from it, which sort of has the same name, but, but it's not the original golf course at all. So, so for years, people have talked about, wouldn't it be great to try to rebuild that? Obviously not in the existing location. They're not tearing down all the houses, but somewhere else. 
And, you know, I've, I'd had the discussion off and on with people. It was a McDonald course. I've worked on a lot of his courses, so I'm really familiar with the style. But I just, you know, A, it's not a creative project. I mean, it's a, I mean if you're going to do it, you're going to try to do as, as exact a reproduction as you can. And I really wasn't convinced that we had, like, good enough, you know, we didn't have a great, perfect map of it to build it from. So, so I was always kind of skeptical of that anyone would be able to do it because you just don't, you know, black and white aerial photos do not give you a 3D version of the golf course. So like three years ago, there's this guy from Chicago who's a financial analyst guy, he does special projects, really brainiac guy. And, you know, after he did finish some big special project, he had some time and he was playing around with like computer game. Go there's, there's a couple of computer golf games that let you like build your own course to play a, a video game. And he started just obsessively grabbing every bit of information he could about this, this old golf course, every picture, every article written about it, every, everything, including like getting LIDAR data from the government somehow. I don't know how he did that, but you know, he, he like used all these pictures and fed information into a computer and tried to triangulate how high is that mound based on I know how high the sign is over there and I know right where this picture was taken from. And he translated it all into video game format that looked pretty accurate to me. Just, just like, well, that's impressive, but how the hell could we reverse engineer that to like get the topo information out of it? Sure enough, some kid came along, oh, I can do that. I'll just make a bot that just goes and picks the elevations on a grid for the whole thing and spit out a topo map in two weeks. <laughs> so now I've got, you know, and I looked at the topo map and I'm like, well, I don't know if this is, I, you know, it's certainly not going to be perfect, but it's a lot better than I would have come up with from scratch. You know, and, I, and I've got to believe that the elevations of like the greens and the tallest mounds, that those are pretty accurate to work from. So we're basically going out and building a golf course the way a lot of other architects do is like take a plan, grid it out, put a ton of grade stakes out there, dig the pond, put the dirt in place for the mounds. And then we'll, you know, my fee is like on a sliding scale because until, until they get that part done, I won't know how much more work there is for me to do. You know, it's at, at some point you're going to be looking at the photos and just doing it by eye the same way when we restore an, an older golf course and how much of that I'm going to really have to do. I can't say until we get a little ways along, but they're just starting clearing on it now. Um, in fact, I got to like, once I'm done with my phone call, I got to sign off on the last couple of things on the plan so they can start digging the lake on Monday. Um, you know, it'll probably take, we're starting late enough this year, we won't get it all done and seeded next year, but there might be, we might get nine holes seeded so that they would be in play in 2022. And then the other holes, maybe by the end of 2022. Um, and, you know, part of it for me is like, boy, people have been talking this about this for so long. Let's just do it, you know, get it done with. <laughs> Hopefully everybody likes it. I do think that some of the other courses success had to do with the fact that it was right on the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> you know, that's that's one reason some of my courses are ranked so highly is and, and I'm sure that has something to do with it. And obviously we're not going to dig the Atlantic Ocean in Wisconsin. So. So we, we won't have that part going for us. Yep. All right. Uh, so you're at essentially two o'clock. So thank you, Tom, for joining us and taking the time out of your day for this. I noticed on the chat, there's some, some people are like, well, can you send my questions to them? Feel free to send me the questions. I won't promise that I'll get back to all of them, but, but I just came home from a month long trip. I'm like quarantining in an apartment above my office for 10 days to make sure I didn't bring anything back with me. So I'll have time. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Tom. Right. We will send the questions your way. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, and yes, as Moana mentioned in the chat, if you have not uh, joined the MIT Alumni Golfers Association, I uh, highly recommend you do that. It's 
a great chance to connect with fellow alums and get out and play with them. Uh, have a great rest of your Friday and weekend. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.